Okay. So I took a look at it, um, and it was a Telepacific uh, TPX now. I guess it did a name change. And so yeah. I did have a question about that, so that's good to know. And I'll, I'll just kind of review all, all of those. So let me start okay. with um, this desktop environment. One of the things that I set up for everybody for the, uh, I don't know, there's like five logins, I think, um, is I created a high-level folder called HWC. And, of course, feel free to, you know, ch change this however you want. But I just put it at the top level of the C drive, which is a hosted in a drive. Um, in this environment, you are able to um, map when you log in uh, your local C drive or uh, drives on your local computer. So you can drag and drop things back and forth between your local computer and the cloud. Uh, we uh, did everything in the cloud, so we didn't really have to worry about ma uh, moving things back and forth. We did also set up a uh, OneDrive, uh, which is a shared cloud drive, kind of like Google Drive or whatever. Um, but uh, everything was, was cloud-based so that anybody could log in and access any client. Uh, and we maintained a standard. We found that if, if we adhere to certain conventions, anybody could pick up any client and do anything with it. It was, you know, like a factory-style approach. So uh, at the top level, now we had multiple other folders, you know, uh, for besides just client data. But um, underneath of the client folder, we had this uh, sample folder structure that we would always uh, clone for every client. And that way, and you, I, I want you to see this, so I'm just going to uh, take a copy of this folder structure. And uh, this particular client is called uh, Child Start. So, hey, Chris, before you go on, can yeah. I ask a question? Yes. Um, are, are you uh, recording this so that we could go back and review to the, review this if we if anyone wanted to? I am. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. So, um, so what I did was I took this folder structure, and I and you you know make you can reinvent this wheel if you however you want, uh, but I just figured I'd start you off with what we had found was a good practice and worked well for us. Um, these are three of the invoices for uh, TPX or Telepacific, uh, and uh, Greg, you said that you, I should start with the most recent yeah. one, well, and so uh, the pricing is different than the older ones. So that it, we only have they're all the same because it's an uh, internet circuit. Exactly, but there was a price change. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, yeah, I noticed that too. So, and I didn't know what your savings were, were based off of, so I wanted to ask that question. So, here is Go one. In, Go, ahead. Go ahead. ahead. Let's just walk through this, and then it's based on that newer date, uh, the one at the bottom. Okay. So, we have this uh, carrier telepacific communications. I'm familiar with them. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the scripting uh, in a minute. Um, and the scripting is not going to be relevant to this particular account, and there's two reasons for it, but uh, I, I do want to take this uh, training session to introduce you to that. Uh, and so we have one invoice for uh, the statement date is January 31st of 2017. We have a second invoice here of, um, looks like it's probably February 28th or something like that, I'm guessing, uh, February 28th, 2017. And then the TPX looks like they did a name change or rebranded or some, something. Uh, and uh, that invoice is uh, slightly different. Let me close this out of the way so everybody can see it. And that's 731 of 2018. So that's the most recent invoice. Um, notice that these invoices are scanned copies where there's handwriting on them and stamps. And I cannot like come in and select text and copy and paste it. And that's relevant uh, for scripting. So we found that one of the productivity benefits of TAMS is the ability to take electronic uh, records like invoices or CSRs or device reports or whatever and run them through a script. And I think I demonstrated that a little bit uh, on a Verizon Wireless bill uh, during the last review and uh, during that overview. 
and to extract information that can then be imported into TAMS. That saves an enormous amount of time of, I mean, this is only a four-page invoice with a, a lot of, of notes and things on there. So this is really going to be simple to do manually, and I think it's worthwhile to see how you can do things manually. You don't have to have the scripts. So, uh, but if you have a 400-page invoice, you definitely don't want a scanned copy. We don't do OCR or anything like that. You could try that yourself, but uh, I tried it and, and, and decided that it was not worth the effort. Uh, there are too many uh, problems with OCR. So anyway, um, so this particular account I'm going to mention to you, uh, I did notice that it has a single internet circuit. I'm going to pull some information off here and you're going to see how we put this information into TAMS. Some of it is just a one-time setup, let's say for a supplier that you haven't used before. And uh, there's some one-time setup for each client. And then there's uh, information that if this was like a long distance bill or a cellular bill, something that had usage, you would want to bring in that usage every month. And you could use that for analytic purposes to get a, an a average of their usage. You could see month by month, like seasonal variations. Uh, and also, for calculating actual savings, if they if their usage doubles and you cut their costs uh, per minute in half, then the, your savings are going to double based on usage. So usage is something that could be very uh, relevant on every month uh, for determining what the savings actually are. In this case, it's a a um, a, a uh, internet circuit. I'm just going to scroll down here. Let me uh, hide this um, little sidebar. Uh, I also wanted to ask something about this USF credit, but um, so they have an internet service that uh, back in 2017 was billing uh, 16.27 a, a month. There's a $30 email backup service on here, and uh, there's it looks like they have four IP addresses, static IPs. <laughs> it's 50 meg uh, access circuits. And they're getting a 50 meg a port speed, which those, you know, this is not telecom training, but you know, you can buy an access circuit that has more capacity than what your port speed is, and then you can increase it as needed. But um, uh, there are, so those are very, uh, uh, um, they're st static fees. So they're monthly recurring charges that don't uh, normally change. There are a few things that I notice are missing on this particular invoice that I would like to know, but we, we're, we're going to get by it without it. Um, and one thing, for example, is what's the circuit ID? Um, but, you know, it's probably some sort of fiber circuit coming in, and uh, I, I like to have that information in my records, but it's, it's not necessary uh, to do what we want to do. So you notice that in... Um, uh, in February of 2017 and March of 20, well, January, February, the end of the billing cycle, um, that the costs were the same, 1657, and uh, in fact, there are a ton of taxes and fees. Now, this is the area that uh, anybody that uh, done any uh, telecom uh, auditing or uh, tracking of savings, these charges are extremely difficult to nail down. Even if you call the carriers 99 times out of 100, they can't explain to you how they computed these numbers. Uh, so we have uh, some mechanisms for managing them in TAMS. Um, here's my uh, recommendation and how we used to operate. And that is, we always wanted to be able to model these invoices to a 1% accuracy. And really, uh, when it comes to MRCs of services and, and usage costs, those would always be to the penny. The problem came in in these fees and taxes, which are not static. Some of them are, some of them are not. And those that are not can fluctuate um, with uh, usage. Uh, localities will change their taxing, like a municipality may change their taxing rate. They may be uh, a function, a percentage of usage, which can also fluctuate each month. So getting these uh, modeled is, you know, easy enough in TAMS, but to get them, every one of these charges nailed down to the penny is something that uh, I would recommend you don't try to shoot for. And so, like I said, we used to shoot for a 1% accuracy. And I'll show you how TAMS 
lets you know if you're within your tolerance, and you can set your own tolerance. Um, if there are charges that are um, uh, a percentage, you can usually determine that by looking at multiple invoices uh, over, a, particularly if there's usage, and get a, a, or maybe you'll become very familiar with what your taxes are in California or something. But uh, I used to know a lot of the various taxes across the country. Um, Canada is very easy, but um, I'm going to go forward to this um, invoice here for, uh, oops, why am I? Here we go. Uh, for the, um, I think this is 2018. Let me scroll back up real quick. Yeah, Ju July of 2018. And what you see is that in July of 2018, this uh, internet charge is higher than it was in 2017. So it went from 1627 to uh, 1706. Still a $30 email service. Uh, and I wanted to pull out some of these um, fees here. Uh, you'll see that the administrative service fee and carrier cost recovery fee are different. So they're somehow related to either they changed over the course of that period of time or they're related to the charges up here. Um, but the funny thing is, is that the sales tax, which is normally a percentage of 457, it didn't change at all. <laughs> so, like I said, trying to resolve this is, is uh, what we're going to show you how to manage it. Okay, now the only other question I have before I go through this um, particular invoice is um, that on one of these bills, uh, there was um, a bunch of credits, credits for universal service fee, and it's this one right here, where there was $8,467.20 in USF credits. Um, do you have any uh, need to capture that and bill for it? Is it something you guys did that you want to see how you would handle that if these were credits that you got for your client? Yeah, really good question, Chris. So those are um, e-rate credits. And during, the, uh, uh, during 2017, they were getting them for the circuit. But then by 18, they were not because they had replaced the circuit with a much more, a, well, much better price more bad. Oh, yeah. Problem, Obviously, yeah. They never disconnected it. And when we caught that, you know, we said, hey, you know, we'll disconnect it. This is our, you know, we're, we're doing other um, uh, audit, an audit on all their other services too. But unfortunately, we are using one of the uh, Scully Mitchell franchisees to do that. And we're not doing it ourselves. Sure. So th this was okay. one that we're doing ourselves, but yeah, so that's, and, and we ought to know how to, how to show that for other clients, uh, because this will come up again. Okay. So, uh, great. So let me, um, <coughs> do you want me, uh, I'm going to call this company TPX now since they re rebranded themselves. Okay. okay. So I'm going to close all these, uh, for just a second. And, um, what I'm going to show you is that, uh, within this, uh, client folder structure. It's just a template structure. It's it's a bunch of blank folders. But we found it convenient that, you know, if you're familiar with the same folder structure, anybody can go find anything they need to with any client. So uh, I'm going to come into the suppliers folder. And you can see we have like supplier one, supplier two, supplier three. Uh, again, it's just a template structure. And I'm going to put TPX in here. Oops, I can't. I'm listexic. And um, the account number, I'm going to come in, and now with each supplier, you might have multiple accounts. And so I'm just going to start with an account number here. And uh, it's, I remember from the invoice, it's 9330. And so now I have a, a hierarchical structure, and I'm going to move all of these invoices that I had sitting here at the top. I, I didn't want to set this up too much because I wanted to walk through it for you to see how simple it is to uh, establish a standard folder structure uh, that would have, you know, the, 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 the information for that particular account for that supplier. Okay. Uh, I'm going to then, I guess, since we want to capture 
those um, credits for E-rate, we I'm going to start with the um, January, let's see, I think it was on this particular bill. Let me just double check if it was the uh, January bill. Yes, it was. Okay. So let's go into TAMS and uh, talk about uh, a few uh, items here that are going to um, uh, be able to capture all of this information and show you how, how we would uh, model all of these costs and then model the changes and uh, any um, one-time vari variations, such as these one-time credits, uh, and then um, how the billing would work for that. So what I did was I set everybody up in uh, TAMS with uh, initial password, uh, password one, two, three, and I just want to uh, mention that something I didn't get to during our overview <clears throat> is that uh, somebody should be probably designated as the administrator for TAMS, uh, or you can all be administrators, but um, within the administration, there is the ability to come in and add uh, users. Um, within the users, details, you just can double click on them and navigate into, and there's help anytime you are on a screen if you push f1 you're going to go to help about that screen so uh, we tried to make it so you don't have to run around searching help uh, to find everything um, so here I am on the user details and you can see I'm on the user details it says it up here it also says it over here by the way I'll uh, mention that I um, if we can get those logos for your uh, white labeling, we just need to put them in a folder, and then your logos will be available on this on the tool and on the reports. Um, so, uh, I do want you to see that uh, right now we, this is a blank database. We don't have um, any clients in here yet. There is also a demo database uh, that all of the help files. If I come under Tams help. And under TAMS demo, I also set up. It's a separate database, so it's like a sandbox. But I also set up everybody's login in here, and it has um, a, a demo client that all of the help files and sample reports and everything are based off of. So if you want to see how something. Um, I'm pretty sure I said it. Here we go. Um, and is that, so sorry, just random question about that, but okay, it's a capital P password. Okay, thank you. Right. And you can change your passwords, you know, uh, but you, it takes an administrator permissions to come in and manage uh, users. Um, but there's a demo client that's in here, and it's a simple client, not as simple as this one account we're working on, but uh, you know, it has some cellular, it has some landlines, it has some internet, you know, so there's, it's a, it's a sampling of, of various things. So um, I just wanted you to know that that's in here. Uh, there is also uh, something that I'm going to mention, so you have the administrator. You can add um, users that maybe you want to uh, um, have somebody from School Mitchell or somebody that's another TAMS user or whatever take over some client work. Maybe you've got more clients than you can handle. Um, you can give them permissions to a single client or just a subset of clients. So something to think about from an operations perspective that uh, each you can give full access to all clients or go through and pick cherry pick individually which clients are going to have a, a particular login user will have access to. Uh, we we use that quite a bit when we were subcontracting uh, with other people. Sometimes as we were growing, we just you know had to get others to help. Um, okay, so enough about that. Um, one other thing that, I mean, there's several things, uh, there's a database maintenance function that should be considered at least once a year, but we can talk about that later. Um, there's exchange rates for currencies, and those are, that's something that I would have uh, a tech uh, once a month go in and put in a, a, 
of exchange rate for U.S. to Canadian dollars because we had some Canadian accounts, but they were large international companies and also had uh, accounts in U.S. We wanted everything to bill in the same currency, so we have the ability to, you know, put in exchange rates and tag a given account what uh, the native currency is. So you can reconcile a bill in its native currency, but then convert it to let's say U.S. dollars for billing purposes. So anyway. Um, and then this is one item that I'm going to mention is the Federal Universal Service fees. They change quarterly. Now you do have on this particular bill some Federal Universal Service fee funds, but the funny thing is is um, that it's very, very small. Normally the FUSF is like somewhere right now it's about 20%. Um, well, that's certainly not 20% of $600. So uh, it's like, Maybe 20% of of, uh, I, I, of of this or something. It's a very very small number. But on some bills, literally like a long distance bill, if it's switched long distance, 20% of your cost is going to be federal universal service. And then there's taxes. Like I don't know California, but I know uh, in Pennsylvania there's about 11%. It's 6% sales tax, 5% gross receipts. Allegheny County has 1%. So if you take 20% of federal universal service and another 11% for state uh, sales and gross receipts and, and county tax, you're up to about a third uh, of add-on costs just based on universal service and taxes. Well, if we save $10,000 a month in long distance, we also want to bill for the $3,000 a month in, in taxes. So we want to model them. Again, we might not get them to the penny, but we're going to make sure that, that we account for those in our savings. And of course, there are savings if you switch to VoIP services or whatever, you know, the different tax structures there. So the reason I bring this up is that we may, uh, you know, so whoever the, the manager is, uh, that uh, maybe the administrator, once a quarter, the federal government changes the uh, universal service fee rate. And there's a website that um, has those rates published. And I actually put a bookmark on everybody's uh, Firefox, although you might want to use Chrome or something else. But this is what came installed on the uh, environment. So I didn't want to, um, you know, uh, take any liberties there to presume what uh, browser you'd like to work with. But um, you, everybody will get an email with the uh, login credentials to what's called our members only site. Because you guys are, you know, have an active maintenance agreement, um, you'll have access to this member site. And uh, the member site, one moment, will have uh, information posted, we do, uh, every other month we have a user group conference call. Um, we have, oh, here it is here. Sorry about that. Uh, Greg, I'm using your login. Um, and in our member site, there's just a few things here that I want to point out, and then we'll get back to reconciling this client. Um, so, one of the things is is that there are these announcements, and one of them that is updated quarterly is what are the newest FUSF rates from the FCC? And you can see that it's 21.2% uh, for January, beginning of January. So in TAMS, 21.2, uh, we're gonna put in, Twenty-one point two percent. Now, any client, every client that uses this rate table, will any invoice that comes in after January first will start using that rate for calculating FUSF rates. Uh, and anything between uh, October first and January first will use twenty-five percent and so forth. So it's a very simple task, um, and uh, it's only done quarterly. If you uh, would like to. Um, we have actually what the link is in here to the FUSF, uh, to the FCC's website, where they talk about these, uh, you know, every quarter, what the rates are. So what we can do here, and this is part of the training I wanted to uh, 
to demonstrate is that we can come over to the scheduler and I can create a task. And this task says um, update quarterly FTSF rates. And I can make it a recurring task. It's going to be um, day one every three months. This is not something that's complicated. Everybody's seen this sort of thing, no end date. Um, and uh, we can assign it. Greg, since I'm using his account, he becomes the default owner of this task, but he can change it to somebody else. Can you go ahead and change um, it? Yeah, look, Chris. To who? Uh, Michaela. Thank you. Great. No I problem. And all of these um, notes in here are rich text format. So you can actually put the link in here. You can add any instructions, paste pictures. You can do anything you want in these in these fields. No reason to spawn a task or anything like that. And it doesn't need to be really um, a high priority or whatever. But and it's not really tagged to a particular client. So we'll just save and close that. And uh, whenever um, Michaela logs in, she's going to get a reminder saying, "Hey, this is past due. It was supposed to be done January of, of 2020." And uh, Michaela, I'll leave that for, uh, for you to um, contend with because all you really would need to do is open this one occurrence and then mark it completed and click save and close. And then that task would be done and it would come up. You want me to do it now for you? Sure, why not? Okay. So okay. it's going to now uh, show you that it's coming up on 4-1 of 2020. And if you wanted to see your completed tasks, you can click this and you can see how far back all of your tasks are. So I just wanted to introduce you to this task manager. And this was a nice way of pointing to you about our um, announcements in TAMS, in the member site, and the task manager, and the concept of having a centrally managed universal service fee rate table. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing that is in uh, this web member site that is probably the most relevant is um, is the conversion scripts. Now we won't be using those today. I just want you to see them, and then I'm going to uh, navigate off of here. Um, by the way, you can uh, well let's go into the conversion scripts. These are the scripts that will allow us to take all of these different providers, and you'll see AT&T fall in here multiple times because they have different types of billing platforms. And so based off of all of these non-standards that are out there, um, but for each carrier, we uh, have scripts to take their invoices or their uh, call detail, depending on the various uh, uh, types of information that they uh, provide, and script it for importing into TAM. So if you have 500 phone lines, you don't need to type them all in, you can just script them. If you have 1,000 cell phones, you don't need to type them, you can just script them in. Um, and you'll notice, by the way, that uh, we also have ttxcom underscore PDF, which is uh, being able to take a PDF and, it, and pull the information out and in, in import it into TAMs. Uh, there's also, um, Telepacific CDR, which is a uh, ability to download call detail records in uh, CSV format. So one's a PDF input, the other one's a CSV input. So we have these different types of scripts. And bottom line is, uh, initially, you're not necessarily going to know um, which is the right one. So feel free to reach out to me for some guidance. But uh, hopefully, with the documentation and all, and then once you establish, oh, this is the right script for this account. You will put a shortcut in that account, just like we have these client. We would put in a Telepacific shortcut in here if we were running a script on it, which we're not. But uh, if we were, then nobody would have to re, re uh, concern themselves with that. It, it would it would be established once and one and done. So, um, and obviously, when it comes to cellular, there's only a handful of providers, so those become very self-evident. It's when you get into like AT&T or Verizon or sometimes the billing platforms can vary, but uh, 
don't don't be uh, intimidated by it. Embrace it because it's going to save you a ton of time. Okay. Uh, now, what you can do is we maintain these scripts for everybody as part of the maintenance agreement, and they're um, using a scripting language that uh, uh, if somebody finds a new, uh, let's say a variation, because billing platforms are modified on occasion, and the script that you run doesn't give you all of the data or the results that you expect, um, then normally what the, what you would do is then contact us, send us a copy of the script that maybe needs some maintenance, um, and we would troubleshoot it and figure out, oh yeah, they changed the format or something or another, and we would update the script and put it up here. So everybody else, one of the things you can do on this library is you can create alerts. So if you have one person that's um, like responsible for maintaining your versions of these, you can get an alert, it'll send you an email, and then you can just say, oh, yeah, we need that script and go and download an updated copy. Now, if we're doing it for you, you're going to know. But if we do it for somebody else, you know, you'd like to get an alert to make sure you have the most recent copy of the script on your server. So we don't put, we don't go out and update everybody's server with these scripts. We create a central repository. And the me mechanism that we use, we kind of, you know, believe, believe in uh, working together. Uh, and um, so whoever, uh, uh, needs a new script or a script maintained, they provide their support time allowance for that year um, to have the work done, and then everybody gets the benefit from it. And so you're getting the benefit of 15 years of other people, you know, <laughs> paying for support to make all these scripts for all these different providers. Now, we did have one person that uh, didn't want to share their efforts to uh, maintenance of the scripts or development of the scripts with, with others. So they did not get all of these other scripts that we just did what they needed for themselves. Um, and you're welcome to adopt that philosophy if you want. But uh, <laughs> there's a lot of value here in these scripts. So um, uh, this is where your productivity gains are really gonna be realized. Um, all right, so you can set up alerts and you can do that on these other things too, announcements and the calendar or whatever. But that's enough for um, for the uh, member site. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and do this account, and uh, I'm going to walk you through this um, system that is really uh, very straightforward. You'll get a um, a, a good uh, sense of the structure. Like I said, this is not a complicated a, a client, and so it might almost seem too simple but uh, you'll see that uh, the same framework works for very large complex clients with lots of accounts and uh, lots of services so just to remind you in the help some people actually print this out and post it next to their computer for the first month that they're working on teams but you know it's a one-stop shop for all of your clients so we're going to create a client when we do that it's going to create a default location because there's maybe more than one location for each client. So, uh, and then we're going to have to have a line of service for this internet circuit. Like I said, we don't know the circuit ID, but that doesn't matter. But we'll, we'll have to have some sort of a representation of that circuit coming into the building. So, um, then we're going to have a supplier. And so we have like this supplier uh, tree, and we're going to have a TPX. And uh, we can put in all kinds of data for TPX, or we can just put in a name. You know, it can be very thorough or very uh, sparse in your details. And the good thing is, um, if you just start with a name, you can always go back later and fill in the details. So you, it's not like there's a roadblock if you don't have all the information up front. You can get a lot done and then go fill in the gaps later. And then we're going to create some plans that represent, that capture the cost, just like when you order a plan onto a, you know, I want some POX line or whatever, uh, or PRI service onto a circuit, then there's costs associated. And this is where all the costs are, are captured. And we're gonna just be using ancillary because that's where our data services. And by the way, this help is interactive. If you click on it, it'll navigate you to the help about that stuff. So um, this is uh, somehow, I, oh, I ended up on, uh, cellular sorry about that um, but here's the ancillary so um, 
the ancillary services, uh, you know, you can you'll get you'll see the details of those. All right, and then of course you can search, and there's indexes. It's just full full feature help. All right, so um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start a new client, and I just click new on the client details, and and as you navigate through these fields, it's going to tell you if it's required or optional. Really, a client, the only thing that's really required is uh, a name. And um, you have to excuse my typing. I'm not the world's fastest typist. But um, I'm going to put in some information here. The more you can put in up front, um, the better things will flow for you downstream. And you'll get an example of that here in just a second. Um, now, we have information that uh, could be uh, quite useful for um, uh, administrative purposes, like, for example, EIN numbers, uh, DUNS numbers. Sometimes that's required by um, carriers uh, if you want to access their accounts or something to that effect. Um, I always like to have a contact information in here. Um, do you have a, a name you can give me? Uh, yeah, why don't you use Debbie, and her last name is McGrath. <laughs> Debbie what? Uh, McGrath. Oh, that's funny. I had a client with the last name McGrath. In fact, I th was is it like this? Yeah. And yeah she that's is, funny. Uh, Aggie Kitty, do you remember her title? Um, it's it's not really important, but okay, it's not. Know, it's not. We can go back and fill okay. all those in. I, I can get that's it. Fine. That's fine. Okay. That's okay. You know, and you can we'll yeah. fill this. We'll fill it in later. We'll fill it in. Yeah, later. because we all. Let me show you. Their, we've got their guns number, the EIN number. We can fill all that stuff in later. Right. And so, really, the only thing that's required is the name, right? Okay. So we're going to save this, and automatically, by default, every time you add a new client, it's going to um, it's going to create a location. For that same, you know, I put in the address. So you always get one location. But this client could have 10 locations. I don't know. But you could add as many locations as you want. And you can drag and drop Outlook contacts to populate. Um, you can import them from CV, CSV files. You know, there's lots of ways of getting volumes of data in there. Or you can just. Um, type in information uh, manually. Let me see here one second. So, for example, okay. um, just a, okay. So, Aggie, when when we pull a record from SharePoint, we can do that in CVS, right, or CSV? I mean, yeah. Okay. So, the, yeah, I'm sorry. Say that. Say that again. Oh, for sure. I'm of like Kadango, which has like 60 locations. So, uh -huh. we could pull if we ever wanted to use this. We we could pull the records from SharePoint. And if we can download it as a CSV file, we can then import it into this. We don't have to type every location in. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, and these guys and here's the, 23 sites. And, and we have import templates that are CSV templates. Okay. So um, they're already available to you. I think if I navigate over, you'll notice I put some quick access links over here. Uh, one of them is in the installation folder, and here's your import templates are right here, and one of them is um, client locations import template. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, uh, and the help files will tell you about that too, and of course we're here to help. Uh, I did want to point out, I also put in a quick link to uh, the, the convert folder, which is where the scripts are stored, and the scripts, uh, as I demonstrated last time, are the ways of, of taking uh, invoices or records and from the carriers and turning them into common delimited files that TAMS can import. And it just puts the headers, you know, on the first row with the field names. I mean, it's, you know, it's an open architecture. Okay. So uh, instead of location here, I might say like headquarters or something like that. Here's their address. Of course, you can copy and paste information. Uh, if you make an edit and you try to uh, exit this window and you haven't saved it, it will warn you, okay? 
so um, I can uh, I always recommend clicking over on this side because there's two X's here these there's actually multiple windows that you can see how they cascade here so that's um, nice but a lot of times when people go to close a the window they accidentally close the whole application so I would say stay over on this side as a, just a quick recommendation. And um, one of the things in the help file that I wanted to mention to you uh, was that um, under this getting started and this overview, this is uh, conceptually what we're shooting for is we're gonna have a client and each client has one or more locations and each location will have one or more lines. We're going to have a supplier, so we have a client uh, called uh, Child Start. We're going to have a supplier called TPX. They're going to have one or more plans based on that internet service bill that we looked at. And then we're going to put them together onto what's the billing account. And of course, the account is a relationship between the suppliers and the clients, and that's what they get a bill for every month. So um, it turns out that you, we also have this concept called sub accounts. Um, and you probably, if you look at any telecom bills, you'll see that sometimes there's, uh, they're broken into sub accounts also. And in cellular, it's really an easy concept that those are like share pools. Uh, but in landline, it may be a little more nebulous, but don't worry about it. It's real simple. So what I need to do is create a line. And that line is going to represent this internet circuit. So let me close this and I'm going to come into location lines and I'm going to add a line and one of the things that I want you to know about lines is of course we can import you know these from the scripts but I can also put in a DN as a directory number it's a terminology that I picked up from Nortel when I worked there but every phone number in TAMS is going to have the MPA and the NXX and then it's going to have the extension number or something else. Now, you cannot put in for the first six digits any random digits like one, two, three, four, five, six. They have to be valid MPA NXXs. And the reason we do that is so that TAMS can figure out what the uh, location is, like what state it's in, um, what LATA it's in, what country it's in, if it's in the North American Dialing Plan. So, um, we have the entire North American dialing plan in TAMS. So, and it's maintained as it changes in the real world, we get updates every month and then about quarterly or semi-annually, we will send an update to TAMS. So, um, normally a phone number would be like their main phone number is something like this. That, that's their main number there in, in the Napa. And uh, I'll just give it the description and say main number. Now, it could have any kind of description. It could be line one, line two, line three, and a rollover group. It could be a POTS line. It could be a PRI. It could be a T1. It could be a SIP trunk or whatever. Lots of other information here. But uh, I'm just going to add this as a line to this main location. And I happen to know that because I Googled it. Okay. But I really am concerned about this Internet. So I'm just going to, the last four digits, does, this internet circuit doesn't really have a phone number. But I'm going to create a, a, a line that tells me the pop that it's located in, and I'm going to presume it comes out of the same uh, um, central office as the main phone number. Now, I can come back and change it later. But notice the last four digits are just INET, and they can be anything. It, be, these can be alphanumeric, but the first six digits must be a valid NPA and XX. And I'm done adding, uh, oops, I said in main number on this one. I should have said internet circuit. So, by the way, we can do block edits. I could click select 50 lines and type something and edit, apply it to all 50 lines. So there's a lot of productivity. Again, th those are things we'll, we'll uh, address, you know, in, in later uh, sessions. But um, So I now have a, a client a location, and a line. The next thing I need is I need to have this supplier in here. And um, the supplier that I'm going for is the TPX. And if I take a look at the suppliers that are in here, we don't have it in the database right now. Now, this is a 
a beginning database. It's a, you know, we have the ability for you to connect to an online database and uh, import plans that are available, although I'll tell you it's probably faster to just put in the plans yourself uh, in, in many cases, not all the cases. I think it's cellular, you, you'll get a lot of uh, ability to import uh, existing plans. Um, of course, you have to change tax rates and things like that. But So again, in order to create, now we're on the suppliers and I don't see my TPX. So I'm gonna just say new. And I'm gonna put in here TPX. Oops. Communications. I really don't need anything else. But I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of things just because um, the uh, web page where you would log in to download invoices, I see it on their bill here. And just ignore the, the man behind the curtain for a second. Uh, well, I finally had it here. TPX, excuse me. I was pretty sure they had it on their uh, online access. www.telepacific1central.com. Uh, one Central. And uh, customer service. Oops. I don't really want you to spend a lot of time watching me type, but I do want you to see the value of putting some of this information in here. Uh, four eight seven eight seven two two. Uh, there's also a repair number. Eight seven seven four eight seven eight three four nine. Um, there may be an email address for their customer service or whatever, but I'm going to just stop it here. I'm going to say that they bill in U.S. dollars. That's the default, by the way, if you don't set it. You could put, like, let's say you need to send a notice for a non-renewal to um, a circuit that's under has an evergreen clause. You might want to capture, uh, and again, even if I don't put it in here now, um, I can come back and add it. Uh, but I wanted you to see uh, this, this, C A, oops, back up, C, there we go, uh, 90071 and U.S. Save. Now, I didn't need all that. All I needed for sure was the company name, but you'll see, I just, you'll, get a good feel for why capturing this information can be useful down downstream. And so we don't have any plans yet, but we're going to go ahead and put in some plans. And uh, what we really need is a 50 meg internet circuit for 1627 and an email backup service for $30. So uh, like I said, this is a very uh, uh, simple scenario. So we're gonna add a plan. And um, you can, on the plans, you can put as many notes as you want. Now, one of the recommendations I make as a best practice is plans can be reused as much as you want. You can put a single uh, local service line on a, a, a bunch of different lines of service. So if you have 10 POTS lines and they'll have the same plan, you can create one plan and stick it on 10 lines so you have this reusability. But there's a bit of a risk if you reuse too much. And that is, for example, you put a line, a POTS line on uh, one client account, and then you have the same POTS lines on a different client account, uh, and so you reuse them, and then one of the clients gets a discount, 10%. Well, all of a sudden, you now are coupled, and if you change the plan on one client, you're gonna affect other clients, so you don't wanna necessarily do that. So our recommendation is, is to, um, is to keep your plan boundaries to a single client. But you can reuse them as much as you want within that client. 
and you'll find that uh, once you have a plan, if you want to clone it, it's just a matter of clicking a button. So it's very simple to duplicate the, a plan for reuse to another client. So in order to keep them straight, uh, I would say that uh, what we would do is use an acronym for all of our clients and um, an abbreviation that would uh, tell us, oh, these plans, if I filter all my plans for CS for a child start, then I know that all of those plans are for a child start. You don't have to do it this way. It's just um, internet uh, service. 50 mega BPS. This is just a title. Um, I'm going to create an ancillary feature because it's not one of the core, like local, long distance, toll free. Uh, but when we click ancillary, we can designate it as a data service. And I'm going to put in here, I assume it's 50 meg both up and down. So we want to capture the speed. Um, the monthly recurring cost for that service was 1627. And we have the ability to capture other, uh, like local fees, which could be all of these things down here, tax rates. You can even, uh, we have a thing called a tax map, so that you can pick and choose which taxes apply to which charges. Um, in this particular uh, internet service, there's no usage, so there's no per usage rate. You know, it's not like per megabyte or whatever. So we don't have to worry about all this. All this other stuff is, is, um, is, um, defaulted and you don't need to worry about it. If it only pertained to California, you could tie it to just a state or it could be uh, any state, you know, uh, maybe the, the same charge nationwide or something like that. So I'm going to save that 1627 onto this plan as a 50 meg, meg internet service. Now, I want to also capture this email backup service. So I could do a new plan or I can cheat and just say clone it and I'll put in here, uh, it tells me, oh, you created a clone, enter a new plan name. So um, I'm gonna say, uh, just like they have in the bill, bill I wanna name things the same as in the bill. I don't wanna have to translate anything or, you know, I want it to be self-evident. What they see on their bill, what you see on their bill, um, is going to be uh, the same. Now, I suppose that's still kind of a data service. So I'll leave it under this category. And that has to do with reporting because we can subtotal by like voice services and data services and conferencing services. But that's really what this is all about is, is for categorization. Say, so now I have two plans. And then actually what I'm gonna do is rather than try to figure out percentages or anything because I've already looked at this, I'm gonna take all of these other charges and I'm going to capture them in one more ancillary service. So um, I'm going to take, uh, let's see, sales tax. So total uh, fees and other charges. Now I can type these in, but since I don't have a, a, a this is a scanned PDF, I don't actually have the ability to copy and paste the text. But I'm going to, I'll, I'll start over with a new plan just to let you see that. And these are going to be um, uh, uh, internet uh, sure charges and fees. And it's an ancillary. So, and so if I go so ahead, you, you would actually create a separate plan for that as opposed to putting it directly into the. Um, into the band that you know the first one that you created for the internet the I, I, that's what that, that is how i'm doing it for this okay you you could put them all under the local fees if you wanted to okay. um i'll i'll say that um one of the things that can happen and uh is that these charges may change without you actually doing an optimization okay and so um You'll find that if they're subject to changes, let's say like the uh, 911 fee changes on a local circuit, if you have that as a separate ancillary, you don't really want to take a hit on your savings because of price went up or down without your you having anything to do with it, right? And so you can change these ancillary services or charges like fees and surcharges 
independent of the optimization that you do. But you can certainly put them together too. But it, there's more than one way to skin the cat. Okay, so it, I just wanted to understand the logic. So I, I like yes. the way that you're, you're doing it then. Okay, thank right. you. Right, now I'm going to actually paste, uh, oh, let's see, I guess I couldn't do it in here. I thought I could. Uh, I can paste pictures into this uh, rich text format, but for whatever reason, oh, I know why, because I didn't, um, I think I'd have to take a snapshot of it somehow, and I'm not sure with your tools here. Uh, take a snapshot, there we go. I think it did it, now let's try it. Nope, didn't do it. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'm gonna put in here, um, if I, that's why I like just copy and pasting um, that you have a admin uh, service fee and that's uh, $58 and then you have you know carrier cost recovery if I thought that these were um, uh, percentages uh, I'd try to capture them as a percentage, but um, I'm not sure that they are. So FUSF, uh, 0.48. And I'm going to, I'll finish this last one. Um, at SUSF, State Universal Service Fee, um, 365. And uh, of course, I can bold and underline this. And then there's other, I'm just going to say tax to the government, taxes, and fees, or fees, yeah, fees and taxes. And I'm just going to put that in here as an 874. And you can come back if you want to and, uh, you know, put in more details. Those total up to um, 89.68. Now, like I said, we could, let me come back here and just close this now, and you're gonna see that I have three uh, three different plans, and uh, I could have taken this um, internet service and taken all these fees and just added them into local fees, or I could have put in some rates for the various taxes. This local fees is kind of a catch-all for all of this stuff. And it's gonna be different for every carrier and every locality on every account. So, uh, you know, but we do wanna capture those costs. Okay, so how do we now put, kind of wire this all together? So I come back to my client details and I can navigate uh, because these windows are still open, or I could go back to the top and drill back down. But when I get to my client, uh, I'm going to add this account. And the account, like I said, is going to tell, ask me to um, select a supplier. And by the way, if you come in here and start adding an account and you realize that, um, oh, I don't have that supplier yet, you can come over here and add the supplier right in this link. So there's lots of ways of navigating uh, that um, make it seem like a, a more complex tool than it is only because you can jump directly from one screen to another but there's not that many screens so we have this account called TPX communications the account number is 9330 and the description is that it's the uh, 50 mega BPS internet service Okay, and I'm going to click Save. And again, I don't have really a lot to do. I do have to put in um, the account number. That's a required field. I have to select a supplier. Uh, the, it's preferred that you put in the description. Um, and I now have an account, and it automatically, just like we created a uh, location when we created the client, it also creates a sub account for you just by default. Um, and so the bottom line is, is that we're going to, uh, now we're gonna create this Trinity relationship. And that is what plans are billing on which lines on which, which sub accounts. And so we go to this uh, screen called Managed Services and there's more than one avenue into this Managed Services. 
since I came at it from this particular account, it's going to kind of set this account up for me. And we're going to assume that um, that uh, we're going to we, we this concept that I want to get across is this idea of we create a baseline, which is where is the starting point for this client and all of its services, and then we track what are the changes or the optimizations that we made. Now, the optimization in this case is going to be deleted. We're going to, I, I guess that's what you guys did, right? Delete the line? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. And let me ask you this. I'm going to back up for a minute about the um, contractual status. Okay. Uh, I didn't address this. How do you bill for that canceled circuit? 50% for two years or three years uh, or what? Uh, three years. 50%. Three years. So I'm going to, on this client, this is not necessarily, uh, now if you're, if you have some defaults, do you normally bill three years? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, close. Uh, I thought I had, I guess we don't. So 24 months is the default. So we're going to make this 36. And so your agreement is quite 36 yeah, months also, right? Like 36. Yeah. And do you yeah. split 50 and 50? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to save that because it's relevant. Um, one more thing that uh, there's going to be this idea here. So whenever I created this account, it established this sub account. And the sub account can also have billing parameters. I'm going to pull this screen a little bit wider. So this sub account, which I'm just going to rename from main, which is a default, I'll just call it 50 megabit internet circuit. You'll notice that it defaults back to um, six months prior to today's date. That allows us to put in six months of the historical data. Now, think of this as a bucket and it has a birth date. I cannot put anything in this bucket until the, it's, you know, prior. I cannot predate an event that goes before 7-24-2019. Well, we're going to go all the way back to 2017 on this one. So this is a really uh, unusual example. Normally, when we would start with a client, we would go get the most recent three months. And so the six-month backdating default is usually typically sufficient. And again, you can change your preferences uh, to say, well, I want to put in, instead of six months, I can make that 12 months or 24 months and make the defaults as far back as I want. I don't really care what they had back in 1987, right? So um, anyway, but since we're going back to 2017, I'm just going to change this default to 1-1-2017. One, one, and I'm going to click up, uh, up to save. And so I just... Uh, moved that back. Now, there may be other factors that are kind of not per pertaining to a single line of service, but are more account-oriented charges, such as volume discounting percentages, or like they have an allowance of uh, minutes, or uh, just some account-level charge. It's not really a plan on a line, but it's at the account level. So, uh, we don't really have to worry about that in this case. Um, so, I just wanted you to know that there's these dates that uh, are relevant to, uh, because TAMS keeps track of everything by date. And so if, until another change comes in, when you put something effective on a given date, TAMS is gonna say, oh, it stays effective indefinitely until another change comes in. So we are gonna to go to this managed line services, and what we're going to do is we want to predate this uh, February of 2017. I don't know what the contract period was. It does say something about a three-year term, it looked like. But I guess I'll just put it on 1-1 of 2017 and say that was, um, you know, good enough. So, um, oh, you know what I think I had done? <laughs> That's interesting. I think I actually could have done a snapshot of that because you can put pictures into those uh, those things. So I think I, it was ready for me to uh, take a picture. I, I think I didn't use a snapshot properly on, the, on the Adobe. Okay, so what do we have? We are looking at this location. It has two lines of service, and we're going to say that we want to put these three service uh, plans onto the internet circuit, billing on this account 
beginning on 1-1 one, one of 2017. Does that follow? That we're attaching or associating these three plans onto this line of service and they are gonna bill on this account beginning in January of 2017. So I click create the baselines and it says, yep, okay, I got all three of them. And I just want you to see, I'm gonna use this quick link to navigate back over to the lines. Remember, I had these line details. Well, over here, I now have what's called line history. And you can see that these three plans are now showing up on that circuit. And I can come over to the uh, account and I can put in a billing cycle and I think this was uh, dated January 31st of 2017. So again, I'm going to um, stay with what the carriers are billing. I don't want things to look different. I want them to look identical. So we don't need usage data. They build on this bill current charges $1,746.68. So I'm gonna put in here, what did the supplier bill? $1,746.68. And I'm gonna add this billing cycle to this account. Now I can double click and go into the details of this bill. Now some bills will have usage, like lots of long distance or cellular, you know, all kinds of you know gigabytes of data usage or whatever. And I could put in usage manually. I don't have to bring in call detail. If I had long distance on here, I could say, okay, I had 10,000 minutes of in-state long distance for you know $400 or whatever the, the, the dollar amount is. But in this case, I don't really have any usage to concern myself with. Um, and I'm just gonna come over to this little tab called billing cycle costs, and I'm gonna say calculate costs. And what TAMS is gonna do is it's gonna take all the information it has about tax rates and monthly recurring charges and usages, and it puts it all together. And of course, all I've done is put in some static monthly recurring charges, and it's gonna say 1746.68. So the TAMS calculated cost matches the supplier cost. Like I said, this is gonna be a really simple example, but you get to see now how next month, if I were to come in, well, we're gonna do it. Um, let me come back down through here, though and see, ah, I'm sorry. They have a balance forward. Uh, looks like these uh, credits, uh, total payments. So in the previous month they paid, balance forward. I don't know why it keeps copying. That's weird. So if I wanna capture these universal service fee credits, Greg, let me ask you a question. Did they show up on this particular account? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you don't need to put those in because we actually didn't start uh, billing them until probably this year because it took yeah. a while for us to point out to them that this was going on, that they had not canceled that circuit. Right. Okay. Well, and I, if, I don't have the actual start date in, in front of me, but we'll go in and change that. It looks like these adjustments actually came in on, on this billing cycle. It, it makes sense. Yeah. So really what we want to do is we want to try to capture these adjustments along with the current charges. Geez, I don't know how to stop that thing from taking screenshots. I, 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 I yeah, oh, here we go. That's what I did. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me do it this way. Our 17, see the total due is actually, uh, negative $6,720.52. So I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna change what this um, total cost is and it's actually minus $6,720.52. So when I come in, we have these one-time credits that have shown up on the bill. We want to capture those. So um, one of the things we can do here is put in what's called a billing adjustment. And it's the same thing that they would do from the carrier side of things. We're going to go ahead and put it on this circuit and we're going to call it a 73116 uh, USF credit. 
and that is a negative 141120. And if you were going to bill for that to uh, get, take 50% of it, you would make it a billable credit. Okay? Now I can control C and copy that, and I can control D it uh, down here as many times as see. I got seven, uh, eight, nine, ten. 12. So um, 831, 930, 1031, 1130, and then 12. Apply. So those credits. Have been captured and now when I recalculate my costs I still am matching but I've now captured all of those one-time credits so if I were to go I just want you to see that now if I come to um, you'll see how there's a little box here called invoiced if um, February comes along and this is the only account on this client we could generate an invoice to them uh, and it's called the uh, right here general it's on the client details and we would click this button to say generate invoice for unbilled savings and we could specify just like last month if we wanted to or we can say everything that's been put into TAMS that is a un that maybe has savings that are unbilled we want to pick them up and send them an invoice normally I would do it monthly for every client so um, we're going to generate this invoice and what TAMS is going to do is go through all of the accounts of a client and that have you know there could be 50 accounts on some larger clients and um and whichever ones have had optimizations on them then they will um uh, be as long as you have a billing cycle in there it will pick them up and uh, i'm not sure why it's taking so long here it's I think the first time you run a report and then after you install TAMS, it takes a second for it to kind of finalize the uh, configuration. So um, it's going to look for changes to services that were uh, optimizations, and it's going to look for any sort of one-time billing credit or charge. So for example, you could also have a billing charge, which would subtract from savings, that if you incurred, let's say, a, you canceled something and incurred a late penalty and you wanted to offset the savings with that late pen, what late charge, um, then uh, it would, here's the, here it comes. Excuse me. So it just says, hey, review this, and if you like it, accept it. If you don't, click cancel. So I say, okay, that's nice. So here's our, uh, I'm gonna expand this a little bit. Uh, here's one location that we have. It's a, a set up for this. If you have multiple locations or cross centers, it would, you know, group them. But under data, we have the 1657 uh, for the baseline cost. It hasn't been optimized. That circuit is still billing at the original rate, and so there's no savings on that. But there's some other savings, and those were those uh, one-time credits. And you also notice that we have these um, uh, those ancillary charges I could make those data related taxes and in fact I think I'll do that just so you can see how that works so um, basically uh, and you want to drill down everywhere that you see a magnifying glass that means there's more detail under the hood and so you could drill down and see these credits in detail uh, that, that since they're billable credits then there's going to be your savings and what TAMS is going to do is it's going to take all of that and it's going to multiply it times your 50% um, or whatever is on this client, and it's going to show the invoice amount, which is half of this number. Okay. Now that's just for that one month where all those credits showed up, um, if, and if that's how you would bill it, fine. So I'm going to show you what happens. I let's say I like this. I can save it as an uh, as a report file and always reopen it. Notice that it encompasses billing cycles that cover January to January of 2017. If I had more accounts in there and they covered other months, then that span would you know, reflect the span. Some people only bill quarterly, depending on the size of the client or whatever. 
Um, I could save this as a PDF, Word document, Excel spreadsheet, or whatever. Um, I'm just going to close it, but let me go ahead and show you that if I liked it and I accepted these results, what would it do? Well, it would put a checkbox in this as, hey, you already billed for it. So if I come back to the client and try to bill again for anything that's not yet been invoiced, and, and I say, yeah, let's do it, and it'll say, well, there's nothing left at this time, right? So if I want to uh, somehow go back and re regenerate uh, that, I can uncheck that and click save. And now I can re-invoice for that uh, billing cycle. You know, and for example, the surcharges, I'm gonna right click and navigate to my plan details. I put these surcharges in, I didn't make them data, so they showed up under the other category. And now if I make them data, they're related to data services. So um, regenerating that invoice would put that $89 uh, under the, the data column instead of under the uh, other column. Now you can see how fast it is. Um, so now I don't have that uh, charge under the other column. Okay, so, so that billing cycle is done. Um, the next billing cycle is actually super easy because that's, um, uh, by the way, I want you to see something that's really convenient. When you go into a billing uh, account under the notes, one of the things you can do is put a uh, shortcut or a link right to that particular folder for that client, for that supp supplier. So under TPX, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it here. And I'm going to highlight it and convert it to a link. And what that does for me oops, is I now, anybody that comes here, I'm going to close this. If I want to go to that folder, I can just click on that link. And uh, it's going to open that, um, that folder for me. Actually, I, I should have actually put it under the, this particular account. I, I stopped at the client. Let's do it this way. So it helps you get right to the information for that particular account. Now, if you had a note like, hey, we're missing one of our uh, E-rate or something, you put a journal in here and said, you know, audit um, 1, 2017, or was that two, two? It was one. 2017 invoice, and you can put a note in here that says uh, missing uh, E-rate credit for whatever. Maybe they didn't go back to June of 2017 or 16. I forget what the 16, I guess it was. And save that. Now that would be there, and it'd be open until you resolve it. So you could follow up on that. And you can get reports on open items by person or you know for the whole organization or whatever. Uh, I guess I'll delete this for now since it's not relevant. Or you want me to leave it in there as an example? Yeah, go go ahead and leave it in as an example. I think. Okay, I'll, and I'll I'll say example. Okay. Oops. Well, I closed that window accidentally, so I'll just reopen it. So what I want to do is I want to look at the next billing cycle. And that has a total of, for the current charges. Now, they had a balance forward and some adjustments, so 632.22. So I don't know what those adjustments are, but that's something that's happened since the last billing cycle. So I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to put in the, the billing date is 228.17. June 28, 2017, and the amount is, um, see, here's this adjustment. It looks like they did give another USF credit. So uh, I'm going to take my total current charges of 1746.68 plus any new adjustments, which is this minus 632. And that's 11, 14, 46. 
So I'm going to put in here 11 for 14, 46. And now I'm going to have another billing cycle for 228 of 2017. I, I know that I need to um, put in this, uh, this credit, USF credit, of 632.22 for 131.17. And I'll put it, now it only gives me the lines that are on this account. Like if I have 500 other phone lines in other locations, it's not gonna give me all those phone numbers to, to pick and choose from. It's just going to um, give me the lines that are on the account. It wouldn't make sense to, uh, to you know, have credits on lines that are, aren't related to the account. So, um, 131.17. Oops. Yes, I credit. Minus 632.22. Again, if we're going to build that as a, a billable savings for E rate, uh, and lo and behold, uh, everything still matches as, as it expects. So, Again, uh, you can build those all at once or in individually. The last uh, step here that we're going to take is the most recent one, and that is that there was a change somehow um, in the uh, charges. And this is how you get to see what an optimization and a disconnect looks like. So, uh, I'm, do you know when it was disconnected, Greg? I don't off the top of my head. We could look that oh. up. Um, and Michaela, maybe you could do that. Um, look for the first invoice that, that included that. The exact date, um, I don't know that we have that readily available. That's fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. So we noticed that the uh, as of um, this was July 31st of 18. And there's no adjustments on this one, so I don't have to worry about like one-time things, except I do have to worry about it because there's this one-time late payment charge, and you'll see how we capture that too. So, but these numbers are different, 1706. So, uh, and obviously uh, the $30 is still the same, but there's also a difference in these fees. So let me just show you how we would handle that. This could have been a change. I take it this was a change you guys did not make. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. So we're going to show a change, and I'm just going to pretend the change occurred on July 1st because I don't know when it really happened. But we can always change the date later. So, like I said, you can you can always refine the information at a later date. But we know somewhere between February of 2017 and July 31st of 2018 that, that there was a change in charge. So may, maybe I'll do July for, or January 1st of 2018 uh, where this change occurred. So how do we handle that? Well, first what I need to do is I'm going to find that plan here and I'm going to go to that plan uh, and I'm going to clone it and it's going to be uh, uh, 2018 rate. I'm giving it a new name so that I don't have two plans with the same name, and that's going to be 170690. Save. That's it. That's all I have to do is to create a new plan with a new name and a new rate. And then I can also uh, come back and take my internet uh, surcharges and fees, and I know they, they changed, so I'm going to clone it. 2018 rate, right? and they add up to um, 84, 87 plus 950, 94, 37. I'm going to save it. Let's see if I can uh, do that. Um, Take a snapshot. Now let's see if I can do that. Okay. And maybe I can put it in here. There it is. Great. 
I just wasn't doing it properly last time. So I, I, I took a, a picture snapshot and put it in here so that you can kind of see what those, where that, that, those dollar amounts come from. Save that. Close. Uh, and all I have to do under my managed services, well, is I'm going to come in here and instead of doing a baseline, I'm now going to do an optimization. But since this is not something that you guys did, we're not going to change our billing. So we're going to say zero duration. We're not going to take any, let's say, hit or credit for these rate changes. So it's a way of, of an optimization. Instead of an optimi operational change, I can just say it's a rate change. Um, I can make it effective on 1-1 of 2018. And so what we're, we're going to do is we're going to pick, we're going to match up and say this internet service changed. It's still on the same account. Notice I could have moved it to another account uh, or another provider even if you were optimizing the circuit to somebody else. But in this case, if we're just going to do a removal of service, the, well, we're not removing it yet. Right now we're just capturing the rate change. So, and I can filter these plans if I want them to say like 2018. I can do a filter like it's like uh, just on me. So I want this plan to change to this plan, still bill on the same account and be effective on 2018. And I don't want my savings uh, that I'm billing for to be impacted either positively or negatively by this rate increase. So I change that one. Great. And then uh, I can change my service and fees also to this plan and uh, make it on the same effective date. And then when I come over to the account, if I put in a new uh, um, charge for July 31st of 2018, 7.31, 2018 and the total is $1,848.42. Notice I do have a late payment charge. So I'm going to have to add that as a one-time billing adjustment. And I could leave it as just a general charge, but uh wait. wait. 1715. It's a good example of it to see uh, some of the vari variables. And of course, we're still spot on. Now, if I, I can navigate here and just go over to the line details, I want you to see we're, we're, we have this line, and the email service hasn't changed since it's original. It's still $30 a month. But the ancillary, sir, are, are these, uh, the 50 meg internet changed. Uh, the rate went up, and then uh, so did the, the surcharges changed a little bit. And if I put in a billing cycle between January of 2017 and January 2018, they're going to use these as the active rates. And uh, if I, you know, go after 2018, it's going to use these as the uh, as the active rates. So the last thing is for us to how do we cancel this and and bill for all the savings? So. Um, that's really simple. So uh, what we need to do is keep track of everything that's been deleted across all uh, of the accounts for any given client. And we, we do that with this accounting practice, which is a, a, another account with a built-in supplier called Deleted Services. And it does not have an account number. They don't get a bill for them. But this is an accounting of removed either lines and or services. Of course, if you remove a line in TAMS, that the way you remove a line is you cancel all the services on it. We're going to save that. You only need to do this once per client. It automatically creates a sub-account, and that's just a, a holding bin. Uh, I am going to, uh, because we were working on things that were pretty far back, it also sets that back a couple of uh, years, so I'll just run it. Oops, going the wrong way. I'm just going to move that back to 2017 or something. Again, it just allows me the the breathing space in time to to go back further than the default of six months. 
Um, and so I'm going to do a man's services. And now what we're going to do is say remove. Hey, he, we're removing these services. And um, I'm going to pick a date, but we can change these dates anytime you want. But let's say we're going to remove them on, well, we know they were active in 20, July of 2018. You want me to set it for January of 2019? Or give me a, give me a ballpark estimate as to when it was canceled. Uh, June of 2019. June of 2019. Great. Now, notice there are some built-in plans that are all zero. So this is kind of like the world's best provider. Everything's free, right? And so um, what we do is we say, hey, we removed these data plans, all of them. Every, all of the fees, the backup service, the internet, and everything. And we're going to bill by default for 36 months. Uh, and it's going to bill on this deleted services account. So we do a remove service there on 6-1-2019. And if I want to go look at the uh, line details, you'll actually see under the history that uh, the, the um, email service now has two records and the others have three. And you'll notice there's some color differences. And really, it's simple. Yellow means that that's what it's going to bill against as what they were paying for their baseline. And the blue is what they're billing for savings on the current line. And of course, it's removed. So it's nothing. It could have been an optimization to something that was only $800 a month instead of $1,600 a month. So and when they're both the same, if the current and the baseline, well, yellow and blue make green, so then it's just going to be green, which means there's no savings because uh, the way that it works is it takes the current cost and subtracts that from the baseline cost, and TAMS knows when to stop billing. So it says for 36 months as of this date. Now, if you want to change this date, you can come in here and pick them by I could say, hey, give me everything that I set up at 6-1-2019, and I could change them to say, oh, it wasn't June 1st, it was July 1st or something, and update. So you can update all these records, and then it's going to be 36 months of savings from July 1st, not from June 1st. So, uh, so let's see how that looks. Well, in order to bill for it, we still need that billing cycle to be put in. So under the deleted services, I can come in here and go on 7, 1 of 2019, or I guess 6, 1 would be the first month. Um, and it's not going to have any cost. It always is zero. So all I'm going to do, well, I'll just say no uses, is put a billing cycle in here. Now, it didn't cost anything. You know, there's no no billing or nothing. Let me uh, tick these off. I don't want them to be included in my invoice. And I just want you to see what this looks like. So if I generate an invoice now for this client, the only thing that's on there is the deleted services account. And I put in a billing cycle so that it will bill for that savings right here. I'm going to drill down. So it had these three services billing at those newest of rates from 2018, and they all cost zero, so it's 100% savings. And that's why the re report says 100% reduction in cost, and there's your 50%. And it will do that every month. All you have to do to get that uh, to bill is to go into the deleted services account once a month, oh, wrong account, and say, okay, 7-1, no usage data. Yep. And it'll keep doing that until let's just put in one for, um, and I can I can come into this if I want, and there's nothing to see. Uh, but if I, um, I can also do a little like, this is kind of like a mini invoice. And it says for this one account, not for the whole client, but show me what the savings are for this one account. Of course, right now, it's the only account with savings. And so it's going to show me the same thing that we just saw for the whole client because it's, you know, it's the only data point there is. Okay. Now, what happens if I come in here and three years later on 7-1 of 2019, 
20, 21, 22. This is now 37 months after <coughs> the uh, optimization. If I come in here and say show cost savings, it will have expired automatically and the savings are gone. So as long as you just keep putting in billing cycles, eventually they will expire. TAMs, and of course you can see that a client with lots of accounts and lots of services, uh, that, that could be quite complicated trying to keep track of everybody's 36 month cycle. TAMs does all that for you. You don't have to deal with that. So I'm gonna get rid of that billing cycle and I'll leave those two in there. Um, now, so how do you remember? Well, anything that's an optimized account, which this one does, because it has non-zero billable durations on it. And of course, you don't have to do TPX anymore because it doesn't have any optimizations on it. It's an old account. In fact, you could come in here and mark it and make it an inactive account. Uh, and then it would suppress it, you know, but and you can keep track of, hey, have we analyzed this account, have we baselined it, have we optimized it, what's, you know, what's the status of this account? Um, but when, what your task for managing this client moving forward for this would be to set a reminder and say, you know, basically add billing cycle for, child start deleted services account and you'd put it on the first and Michaela I guess I'll give you that one too and you'll notice that it's all automatically set up as a recurring task now it says day eight of every month and that's because usually we give it a week from the billing cycle dates for bills to show up online because they don't always come up the day that the bills are so the default is one week after but I can change this and say no we're just going to do this on the first of every month and it um, started it the, the month after the last billing cycle that was in TAMS. So if you want to, you could just say, well, we're going to start this uh, instead of 8-8-2019, we'll start it today or, you know, 1-1 of 2020 uh, and save and close that. So now that's on your task list. And when you come in, it's gonna you're going to have a reminder every month to just come in and basically add a billing cycle that's all you got to do it's zero cost and it will know to look backwards in time and find out what it used to bill and and what the savings are to bill for it so now you have two tasks on your cash list so that covers um how to baseline an account uh putting in you know uh lines and create a supplier and some plans um how to optimize when plans change, which they could be billable or non-billable changes, and then how to uh, do a deleted uh, circuit and bill for those deleted savings, and also one-time adjustments for things like um, uh, one-time credits that are billable, or like in this case, we had a late fee, which does, is non-billable and does not affect your billable savings. So I think I covered everything I wanted to. It took a little bit longer than I thought, but uh, um, we got through it all. Any any questions? Yeah, I, I do have one. You also, as I recall, have a cumulative savings uh, that's part of the report. Is that correct? Yeah. So we uh, there's like 90 reports now or something like that. But um, so under some of these uh, accounting or administrative. Um, like you can do a historical spend profile on the client and uh, of course you only have one client in here now. Um, and so it's going to show the data points of what uh, is in TAMS. Um, and so um, obviously there was a big credit. These are inclusive of everything, you know, and then they had some charges uh, with some credits. And the longer, you know, the more data you have, the more relevant that's going to be. We have reports by um, spend level, uh, by um, so location, or by supplier. By, uh, here's your historical cost savings graph. Now, these, uh, this graph, I think, is only after you accept the invoices uh, that it will um, show what the, um, uh, let's see if it has, yeah, I only accepted one month to demonstrate. So 
you know, uh, this was the baseline cost, and these were the optimized. Of course, that includes uh, the one-time credits that were billable. Um, so these graphs aren't really uh, very, very exciting at this point. I, we do have some saved graph reports to demonstrate them, but you wanted to know about accumulated savings, right? Yes, exactly. And whether that, like, if you bill somebody um, the first month, the cumulative savings, of course, for these guys is going to be that um, total. Eight, it'll be what eight, um, nine hundred or something. And then, you know, as we go forward, it, it, I, I just wanted to know if you can actually show that on the invoice itself each month, so that they get a sense of the progress. How, how, how? Oh, this oh, oh! I see. So the invoice does not show accumulated savings. Of course, you could export it to Word and stick it on there, uh, or we could customize. Well, see, un unfortunately, the the scope of the report is only the included invoices for that uh, cycle. You know, so if you're only billing. Let's say you have five accounts that are optimized, and you do an invoice for those five accounts. It's only going to include one month for those five accounts, or whatever. You know, but but. There are, let's see something here. So um, we have some engagement. There are uh, some reports. And I'll have to take a look. I, there's so many I forget. But I do know that under some of the, like this one form letter, engagement ending, uh, one of the things that the, this form letter does is uh you must have just got your word set up too because normally this thing pops right up but yeah it's they only i haven't even gone into word yet so let's uh, see if it works okay. hopefully yeah. it works um here it is okay it popped up cool so okay i didn't uh um were cut by, see how it put some totals in here? Now these were uh, um, actually um, from the one-time credits, right? I did not invoice and save for the deleted service. If I had, there would be savings under this data internet service. Uh, so what this does is it will, uh, we can total up um the uh savings um and anything that is in the um other category which is like billing adjustments um will will show up in here now we do have i want you to know that when we you know there's a lot of reports and one of the analysis reports that is most uh common is to um run an analysis report as of a given date. Now remember, everything's date sensitive. So if I were to say, hey, show me what my predicted monthly savings are as of 3-1-2017, uh, well, it would be zero because I didn't have any optimizations in there and it can't predict what one-time credits might be because they're one-time, right? But if I were to say as of, uh, 712019. Uh, and of course, you can take averages of usages or whatever. That's really not relevant in this case. And I want to see things that have been deleted. Then this report is a um, analysis across all of the accounts. And of course, it shows this one on the live through it because it's being shown as being deleted. Again, it's deleted by virtue of all services being removed from it. But it will show you an estimate of what you would be billing each month. And this is the only account, it's the only cost, it's all removed, so it's 100% savings. If there's other costs in here, then that percentage is going to go down. And then, depending on any other optimizations, will you know, affect this number too. Um, that report is also part of a document that you can generate for your client, and I'm just going to include data services uh, in here. Uh, and that um, it wants a fax number, uh, but it doesn't have to have one. 
Um, it's just trying to send the fax number to the report. So, you know, as you get into more complicated clients with lots of different lines and services, you'll see the value of these reports uh, to be able to navigate and inspect, summarize, and drill down and get details. So you kind of can go from high level views to low level views. Um, but in the, uh, this is the telecom analysis report that we can generate. And it has a cover letter, you know, to Debbie McGrath and, you know, um, service agreement uh, dates and whatnot. Um, each person that generates it, it'll sign it, you know, according to the information in, in TAMS. Um, these are Word templates so you can completely customize them you, the way you want. But notice it's going to um, annualize the savings. And this is like with, and so we, we found it easy so that uh, to put information in here and then uh, manually the analyst can decide, oh, is this our initial for like preliminary findings or additional, like it might be a follow-up. So, you know, you can modify this document um, very uh, uh, easily and we'll save some of this for another day. but. Um, it has some boilerplate language. Again, it's a word template that you can put in however you want, you know. Um, but because I select the data network services, it has some boilerplate language and whatnot. And then given that you have a uh, a, a, a three-year billing cycle, it shows what the savings would like look like over a five-year period. And of course, you guys would be splitting 50-50. This all comes from those parameters in the database. And that the client is then going to save 100% of that over the years four and five. And you're familiar with this from the school admission model, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I think this is, um, so anyway. And these templates can be, um, you can, change these templates to however you want them to look. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to demonstrate the generation of these uh, form letters and reports. But the accumulated savings is a, is one that uh, is not standard in the invoice. Uh, what I do, what I did do um, was I would take those numbers and put them into um, what's called a progressive invoice in QuickBooks. And so I would take the estimates over the three year period from the TAR, and I would create a, uh, it's called a, a you know what a progressive invoice is in, um, in, uh, in QuickBooks? No, because we don't use, we don't actually don't use QuickBooks, but um, okay. we, we can do. I, I know what you're saying, and that's a that's just as good a way to do the cumulative savings. I mean, it would be nice if right. it would be populated. And that would actually then, it was like a cover page, and then the report from Hands was like the detail. And the cover page from QuickBooks would, would show all prior billing and show the accumulated savings over time. So because we had that capability with QuickBooks, where we would uh, come in and... Um, uh, let me close this. Let's just say this was the only thing on this client. Our estimate on in in QuickBooks would be a billing of thirty two thousand nine sixty two eighty six, and then each month I would create an invoice against that estimate, and then it would accumulate the the billing every month and show prior billing, current billing. So in essence, we got that functionality that you're asking about right out of QuickBooks, so we didn't put it in Tails. Um, we, we can talk about that later. I was just curious about that. And um, yeah, I, I don't have and any more questions unless somebody else does. Chris, um, I think so. Chris, this is Kitty. Um, so the reports that are available to us are based upon our client information. Um, so if I were to go out and start, you know, talking to clients and everything, are there any, um, you know, sample reports 
even though we don't have anybody in our database quite yet, are there yeah, samples great. I can share? Yes, there are. Yep. Okay. Um, so hang on. I'm going to show one of the things I want to do is also um, set this root folder for Child Start. And it's just a quick way that anytime you are working with Child Start, it'll take you right to the root folder. Um, so we have two things. First of all, there's a, a report, you know, these reports that I'm generating here. Um, we have a thing called a report viewer, and it's redistributable. You can send it to your clients, and if you wanted to send them reports that have this drill down capability and export to PDF or Excel or whatever, you can redistribute the report viewer at no cost. Um, but in the report viewer, there is a set of, um, of sample reports. And so you'll see here, Dan's report viewer sample reports. And let's just say we wanted to do a, um, a landline invoice that's cost center based. So they say, what's, the, what's your invoice gonna look like? You could open up the sample report and it's been scrubbed of any sort of proprietary or confidential information. Uh, you can also open up those sample reports right from the TAMS application. Let's let this one open up a second. Um, so there's a ton of reports there. There's inventory reports, and it might be really useful to just look through these sample reports to get a feel for the breadth and depth of, of reports that are available. Now, they have our logo on the sample reports, um, but um, you can demonstrate to them how you could drill down onto a main location and see the details of the lines and the savings um, that you are going to perhaps, uh, when it comes to things like long distance, um, that you can, and th there's like a navigation bar over here. So if I wanted to go to a long distance account and go to these lines, it, it'll, it'll navigate you to them. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can get down into some nitty gritty details on these things, um, like see how much, what the per minute rates were for the optimized and for the baseline for the per minute rates, how much usage there is on average and whatnot. It's just a demonstration of the layout and uh, what the reports, it was, you know, we didn't want to uh, overwhelm. Um, but uh, so these reports, and they can all be exported to, to PDF or Word or whatever. So these sample reports, you can also open them from within TAMS by saying open saved report. So there's the tool, the report viewer, and um, whenever you have a report that has been saved, uh, the RPT files are registered to the viewer, so all you have to do is double click to open them. I like to just kind of open them right from the, uh, from the file. But this is where you would see maybe um, things like uh, historical cost savings for landlines or cellular, you know, there's a bunch of different ones. And so this would be an example of, here's what your costs were doing over, over time. Um, and here's the baseline cost of what you were paying. And then here is the optimized cost of what you actually did pay after we did our optimization. So the gap between those two curves are what we saved them. Um, and so that's an, another example of another report, you know, um, and, and there's more, there's, like I said, there's, there's 80 reports or so, somewhere like that. So they're used for that sales cycle so that clients can see you're just not using the back of a napkin. You're, you know, gathering an enormous amount of information and acting on the data and that that data is accurate because you know that you calibrated things to 1% accuracy uh, and that your current, your baseline costs and your current costs are all well, uh, you know, uh, defined uh, so that you know with impunity what the savings actually are. Perfect, that's exactly what I was looking for, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and when, okay, Michaela and I have to drop off, we, we have a call at 11. So if, if yeah. you guys want to continue, please do so. But um, we have to go. Chris, thank you so much. This is uh, you know a really good start for all of this. And, yes, uh, I think it is too. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay. And, and, well, and all right. We can talk about you know what next steps are. Uh, yeah. uh, but this was I think a good introduction, and you know we definitely want people to get in and start because as soon as you 
use it, you can only learn so much watching, you know. Yeah. It, you're very, you're very right about that. And thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. All right. Okay. 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 Have a great weekend. Thanks, Chris. Anybody? Hey, yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else have any questions before we end it? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. I'm okay. good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Chris. Uh huh. You're welcome. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Chris. Right.